God bless you and welcome to Christ Community Church. It's a delight to worship the risen Lord Jesus Christ together and to study his word. And today I want us to see what the Bible has to say about rewards. The road to reward means living faithfully for the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is a crown of rejoicing. Your Bible may say a soul winner's crown, but it's when we live our lives praying for others, telling others about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus, he spoke of eternal life, not as a reward, but as the gift of God. And we can trust what Jesus Christ has declared. And we can take him at his word completely. Eternal life is based entirely on what Jesus Christ has accomplished at the cross of Calvary. Scripture makes it abundantly clear that the only thing God requires of us for eternal life is to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, and that God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, and that His shed blood is our payment for the penalty of our sins. You and I, we are justified by faith. It is the gift of God, not a result of any works, lest you might boast. It is the kindness of God that leads men and women to repentance. And eternal life is the gift of God that we receive when we come by faith and place our trust in God's Son, Jesus. Once we choose to believe in Jesus Christ for salvation and accept God's free gift, you and I, we can begin to obey the Lord as demonstrated through our lives and our daily choices in order to lay up treasure in heaven where rust and moth and thieves cannot break in to steal nor destroy. The Bible refers to these rewards as crowns. And I want you to win these crowns, these rewards. Today, we're going to look at what the Bible says about the crown of rejoicing, sometimes referred to as the soul winner's crown. It's reserved for those who devote their lives and their attention to praying for lost people, sharing the good news with people who've never received Christ. For who is our hope or our joy or crown? Hope, joy, crown. Those are key words of exaltation or rejoicing. Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. First Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. It's those who choose to live their lives sharing their faith for the purpose of winning people to Christ, telling them what God's word says, that they can have their sins forgiven. They can have the penalty of all of their sins paid for in full. All of the crowns of reward are a symbol of authority. And knowing this should give you and I incentive to pursue the things of the Lord in service and ministry for the kingdom of God while living here on earth. You and I can live faithfully for the Lord Jesus Christ. Before we study God's word, let's pray and ask the Lord to meet with us today. Father, thank you that you love us and that you've reserved great reward for those who choose to live faithfully for you. Blessed be the name of the Lord who was and is and is to come. May we give you our best, Father God. We lift up America and pray healing on the communities and cities of this great nation. We thank you for those who have given their lives defending this great nation. The men and women who have served in the various branches of the armed services. We thank you, Lord, for these families who have given the ultimate sacrifice, their, their loved ones, their special gifted ones, Lord, that have given their lives in defense of America. We pray that you would meet with them today. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Take your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 25. For the kingdom of heaven is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possession to them. And to one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. And he went on his journey. Immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more But he who received the one talent went away and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. And the one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. The one also who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted to me two talents. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid. I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, You have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank. And on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has shall more be given, and he shall have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. And cast out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And may the Lord add his blessing to the public reading of his word. The very first biblical truth is the master trusted them. The tragedy of wasted opportunity is the theme of Jesus's parable of the talents, which we have just read together. The parable describes the balance of believers looking forward to his coming with anticipation, living in preparedness for his coming through faithful service. In verse 14 of our text, the man was about to go on a journey. Obviously, he was planning to be gone quite some time. In order for his estate to be managed well, he called for his own slaves. He knew these men. He entrusted his possessions to them. And the fact that these were his own slaves reinforces that The idea that Jesus is illustrating his church. You are the church. And the Lord is giving an example of what it is like. The man in Jesus' parable had three such trusted slaves to whom he entrusted specific possessions that belonged to the master, but he would be away for an unspecified period of time, and he was putting them in charge To one he gave five talents, to another two talents, and to a third one talent, each according to his own ability. And that is a key phrase in this text. Satisfied, the master thought his money was in 
capable hands while he was away for some time. Because the parable illustrates the kingdom of heaven, what Jesus is talking about, the man in the story, the master, represents Jesus Christ. The slaves represent believers of Christ's family. And we recognize this is the Lord's visible church that he's talking about. And you and I, we are given uh, gifts and abilities that we'll be accountable for someday. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we, we must all appear. Notice how inclusive this is. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. This is not a judgment on sin. If you've confessed your sins, the Lord is faithful and just to cleanse you of all of your sin, all of your iniquity. You and I will not be at the white throne judgment. That great white throne judgment is man's last day in God's court. It's talked about in Revelation chapter 20. We'll be at the Bema seat or the reward ceremony. I believe it'll take place quickly, shortly after the church has been snatched away and we're with the Lord in heaven after that command to come up here and we'll be with the Lord. Thus, we will always be together with the Lord. And he's going to settle accounts because he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But God's word is very clear, for we must all appear before the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body. And let me share with you that even when Jesus was in the land of Israel here on planet Earth, his 12 disciples had different levels of responsibility. He had an inner circle of three, Peter, James, and John. They all had different authority and, and different job assignments. There was a, a chain of command that they followed. I believe heaven is structured that way. The angels operate under a chain of command. And actually, when you think about it, Satan's demonic kingdom, the demons that, that serve Satan, they also operate under a chain of command with different levels of authority. It's significant that he gave one slave five talents, another slave two talents, and a third slave one talent. It's significant that the first two doubled their master's money they didn't make the same amount of money, but it was the same percentage of money. But that master gave different amounts based upon their abilities. He had studied their trustworthiness, their talent, their skill, their capacity. And he was looking for faithfulness. It was a test. I want you to see that in 1 Corinthians 3.8, each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. It is not the same. Everyone's experience in heaven will not be the same. Each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. The Lord sees this. Nothing escapes the master's eye. And he sees even a cup of cold water in my name. When you pray and intercede for others, the Lord sees that. When you give faithfully and generously, the Lord sees that. When you fast and you do an inward inventory and you're maybe fasting for God's hand to move in a situation, the Lord sees and he rewards in secret. He is, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The second biblical truth is that the master distributed talents. Now think about this. He distributes talents. You see this as kids grow up. They have different temperaments and personalities. Some are more verbal than others. But God 
creates us like snowflakes. There are no two alike, even growing up in the same family and the same set of parents. God gives gifts and abilities. He distributes talents. And we're not to look at our talents and compare them with another's. We're just to maximize what God has given to you. He's given you these skills and abilities intentionally to be used for His kingdom. And so these men were given talents by their master. It's a tremendous thing to think about. There's a great commandment in Scripture that I think about as I read this parable of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's found way back in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. And when you use the gifts that God has given to you, what He's placed in your hand, you'll want to serve the Lord with your soul, your might, your heart. You want to surrender your life to Him. These first two slaves traded, and they doubled their master's money. It's interesting. You see that in verses 17 and verses 16. But the third slave, his behavior was completely different than the first two. He who received the one talent, he went away. He dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, hiding valuables was not uncommon in ancient practices. However, he had a responsibility to advance his master's wealth and asset and his kingdom and he did not do this. He, he was somewhat lazy in the entrusting of this talent. And he knew what he was doing was not what his master wanted. And eventually he would have to sit down and settle accounts with his master. And that's the third biblical truth. I'm going to pick it up in verse 19. The master settled accounts. Now, the first order of business when the master came home was to settle accounts with these three slaves. And I believe as Jesus is teaching this parable, that's what will take place when you and I meet the Lord in the air and thus we will always be with the Lord. That he'll settle accounts. There'll be a great reward ceremony, the Bema seat of Christ, when he hands out great reward and crowns that you will have the privilege of casting at his feet, laying them at the feet of Jesus. But this master comes back after a long journey and he settles accounts with him. In verse 20, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more. He was not boasting. He was reporting of what he had done in Romans chapter 14. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee should bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us shall give an account of himself to God. So each one of us then shall give account of himself to God. It is a true and coming event in your life and mine. When the master said, well done, good and faithful slave, he was commending not only his accomplishment, but his attitude. God looks way beyond the coat and tie and the haircut. He looks right into the heart. He looks at the attitude of one of his servants. And you and I are bond servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. He looks at our heart, whether there's complaining or bitterness or whether there's thankfulness and joy. He's entrusted to us great gifts and abilities, and he wants us to use them for his kingdom. I want us to see in this text something that has jumped out at me as I've studied this passage. 
It's in verse 23. There's a second reward that he gives to these faithful slaves. He says, enter into the joy of your master. Not only does he say, well done, thou good and faithful slave, good and faithful servant, but he says, enter into the joy of your master. Now, I'm not able to describe what that joy is, but I'm looking forward to finding out what it is. What it is to enter into the joy of my master, the one I serve, my king. And I liken it to when I see a toddler with just unrestrained joy and squealing and laughing and dancing. And uh, it, it, is, it is just so uh, uninhibited. And it's a great thing to see. And I've looked at toddlers here at church and I've thought, look at that unrestrained joy of that little boy, that little girl. And it's an amazing thing to think about. Sometimes the cares of the world weight us down. The worries of uh, the details that we're facing and we forget what it's like that the best is yet to come and that God has promised to never leave us nor forsake us. Matthew 25, 23 is a part of the text that I think is just uh, wonderful to read aloud. Here's what the master says. And this is what I want the Lord to say about you. Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Notice it's a commendation. Well done. You're going to be put in charge of many things for all eternity when we get to heaven. And you'll enter into the joy of the master. Now, the third slave did not receive this commendation. He did not receive this joy. In fact, the third slave his response to the master was disrespectful. Master, I knew you to be a hard man. It sounds accusatory to me. Reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid. He's blaming the master for his choice to be afraid. It's a choice to be fearful. I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. He was washing his hands of this opportunity that, had, that he squandered and this responsibility that he did not live up to. Now, he identified as belonging to the master, but he really wasn't representing his master's benefit. This slave is like some who call themselves Christians, but there's not any fruit in their life. It's interesting to see that. And there's a fourth biblical truth, the master's reward that I really want you to listen carefully to. Jesus made clear that the visible church will always include genuine followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as those who are not sincere in their profession of faith. It's lip service only. It is not a surrender of the heart. Every church has tares that are indistinguishable from the wheat, both wheat and tares, and only God really knows who belongs to him. Their true character cannot be determined by what they do or what they say outwardly, because unbelievers can be very active in the church and seemingly interested in the things of God, but they're not really. They've not surrendered their life to the Lord. And as far as God is concerned, they're really not a part of His family or His kingdom. Whatever such a person may do with the abilities that he has from the Lord, God is placed into their DNA. They are spiritually unproductive. And their light is hidden away. In the kingdom of God, especially in the Lord's sovereign rule, there will be no acceptable service offered to him except that which is offered 
by true believers, genuine followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 28 of our text, therefore, when Christ returns, Jesus will figuratively take away the talent from that individual and give it to the one who has 10 talents. Now notice verse 29. To everyone who has shall more be given, and he shall have an abundance. But the one who does not have, even what he does have, shall be taken away. And a genuine follower of the Lord Jesus Christ who wastes his abilities, who does not use his spiritual giftedness, and the opportunities that God has given to him, his work will be burnt up, and he or she will suffer loss. Yet that individual will be saved, yet so as through fire. And if any man's work is burnt up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire. 1 Corinthians 3.15 the person represented by this slave in the parable has no faith at all. Therefore, no saving relationship to God through his son. And Jesus is giving us a warning. No matter how much he may appear to have been blessed by God, a part of this wonderful family, one day that third slave will hear from the Lord's own lips these devastating words, listen carefully, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That's a sombering thing to hear. In verse 30, the third slave was utterly worthless and his fate was to be cast out into the outer darkness. And in that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, just like the man who tried to crash the king's wedding feast without the proper garments. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man was there, not dressed in wedding clothes, and he said to them, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And that man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And let me remind you, outer darkness is a common New Testament description of hell. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Light always signifies God's presence, and darkness always signifies God's absence. When you think about it, Hell is not only eternal darkness, it's eternal torment. And in that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, unrelieved agony of being separated from God's presence. I want you and I to receive the crown of rejoicing, often referred to as the soul winner's crown. It's reserved for those who pray for lost people, you, you're on your knees praying for people that you know are not saved. They do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And you're concerned for them. And you go beyond praying for them. First you pray, and then you ask God to give you an opportunity to talk about the Lord, talk about the good things of the Lord. Christ wants us to win this crown of rejoicing and I want you to win it. I want to win this crown. Let's give our strength, our energy, our resources to telling others about Jesus Christ. Let's anticipate what it's like to be in His presence. As we worship the Lord this morning, you can ask Christ to come into your life by faith. Or you can ask the Lord to give you courage and strength, and a heart of compassion for those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. Do it today.
God bless you for joining us today. Thank you for studying God's word and thank you for living generously and supporting the work of the ministry that we might tell others the good news of Jesus Christ. You are the church. 
And over and over again in Scripture, we are instructed to be courageous, to live boldly. So until we meet again, live for Christ. Haven't I commanded you? Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. Be strong and courageous. Joshua, what?